Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the sermon today is Genesis chapter 3, the fall. If you'd like to turn there uh, in your Bibles or go there on your smartphone, we're going to look at Genesis 3. And I'll set the stage a little bit while you're turning the pages to get there to Genesis 3. This week, we've seen the news reports of the terrible earthquake and the tsunami that resulted from that that struck Japan. There are hundreds dead. The count could go quite a bit higher as they continue to search through the rubble. I saw on Facebook uh, last night that there is one village of 9,500 people where half of those people are still not accounted for. So this could go quite a bit higher. I don't think it will be anything like Haiti, even though the magnitude of the earthquake was more than 100 times stronger. Uh, but Japan is a, uh, I would say, first world nation, not a third world nation. Many of their buildings are built to withstand earthquakes. Um, I also know that they're having trouble with a couple of their reactors. A couple of the cores apparently are in meltdown. They're not able, as well, lack of power and so forth to keep them cool. So it's quite a disaster, uh, and the repercussions, you know, go far and wide. Fifty countries were hit by some kind of wave uh, emanating across the Pacific from this tsunami, including uh, the United States, where in California an eight-foot uh, wave came in, and people who bizarrely ran up to the beach to take pictures were swept out to see, and at least one uh, is missing from that. I don't get that, but I know people do that. It's like when hurricanes come and they go out and surf in it, and it's just asking for trouble. But things like this happen, and people wonder, and I think it's perfectly natural to wonder, they wonder two things first. Why did this happen? And second, how could a good God allow bad things to happen. Whether it's terrorists flying aircraft into the World Trade Towers and knocking them down and killing over 3,000 people, or whether it's uh, the uh, tsunami in Indonesia, the earthquake in Haiti, and now this uh, disaster, people want to know why do these things happen and how can a good God allow them to happen? This is why we're looking at Genesis chapter 3 today. We're going to answer both of these questions out of this text. So if you'll go with me to Genesis 3, chapter, excuse me, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Here we are right immediately after creation. God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. He created them ex nihilo, which is Latin meaning out of nothing. There was no pre-existing matter. He simply spoke everything that is into existence. The serpent was more crafty. We know from Revelation that the serpent is the devil. We also know that from further in this text. He said to the woman, did God actually say, this is what the devil does, did God actually say he twists God's words like he did in the temptation of Jesus in the gospel lesson today. For it is written, he's quoting the scripture, twisting it for his advantage, and now he's doing the same with the woman. God had given specific instructions what to do. Now, he's also doing something else here. When God created the heavens and the earth and all of the, uh, the things that are in them, he established a created order with man at the top of that created order. Man is the pinnacle of creation. He also uh, established a family order. God created Adam first from the dust of the earth. He breathed, or nephesh in Hebrew, nephesh, life, uh, into Adam's nostrils, gave him the breath of life, and he told Adam, don't eat from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Just that one tree, don't eat that fruit, or surely you will die. In other words, not because the fruit was poisonous, but because breaking God's commandment carries with it the penalty of death. That sounds kind of harsh for just eating some fruit, but you need to understand that God is life. And if you separate yourself from life, all you can get is death. Okay. 
So God told Adam, don't eat that fruit. Now, Adam's job was to pass that information along to Eve. God made her later, after he'd already given Adam the command, he created Eve. And Adam did tell Eve, don't eat that fruit. And we know that because she has this conversation with the devil. Now, something else also happened during the six days of creation, not seven days of creation, six days of creation. On the seventh day, he rested. He was finished already on the end of the sixth day. Something else is happening. At some point in there, and it's not recorded in Scripture, God made the angels. Not recorded in Scripture what day, but he made them. And there was a mighty battle in heaven. Uh, the devil, uh, Satan, uh, in Greek, deceiver. The devil, uh, the Bible says at one point his name is Lucifer. That's from the Latin lux, which means light. Remember lux dishwashing liquid? I guess that means your dishes sparkle like light. I don't know. My mom loved it. I remember it. Lux means light. Lucifer comes from that root word. He was an angel of light. He was quite the awesome creation among the angels. He was special, and he turned against God. He became so impressed with himself, he decided that he wanted to overthrow God. There was a battle in heaven. We're told that Michael the archangel was the captain of God's forces in heaven. They defeated Satan and threw him out. At one point in the Gospels, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Okay. So the devil was thrown out, being thrown out of heaven. He was in the world and is still in the world, roaming around, ready, waiting to see who he can devour. Satan has continued his battle against God in this world. Okay. He has continued his battle in this world. So now he's wanting to wreck creation on this earth. So he says to the woman, did God really say? In other words, he's upending the created order. Adam is the head of the household. Adam was given the instruction by God. He told Eve, it was Adam's job to make sure nobody ate the fruit. The devil goes to the woman to usurp the authority of the man and God. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He's trying to create confusion. Okay? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So he's countermanding God. No, 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 you won't die. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, two things are going on here. First, you have to understand that Hebrew knowing is different than our modern conception of knowing. We take knowing intellectually. One plus one is two. I know that because I've been taught that even without adding two things together. I know that academically. In the ancient uh, Hebrew, knowing is also experiencing. So there are two things the devil is doing and saying here. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God because you have experienced evil. He's accusing God of being evil. It's the first thing he's doing. The second thing he's doing, he's tempting Eve to be her own God in God's place. You'll be like him. You'll be a God. You'll be divine. God's keeping you down here. Raise yourself up to his level. So the woman eats the fruit. She gives it to her husband. He eats it. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The problem wasn't just that they were naked. At the end of chapter 2, it states that they were naked and they were not ashamed. Now here in verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7, they're naked and down. now they're ashamed. It's not that being naked was the sin, otherwise you would be sinning every time you took a bath or had a physical. That's not the case. The problem isn't that. The problem is that their sin is exposed. They've gone and done what God said specifically do not do. Now they have no protection. Now they're going to fall under his wrath. Now the bad thing that, ha that God promised would happen, death, is going to happen to them. They sow fig leaves for protection and to cover up what they're feeling, their guilt and their shame. To this day, we wear clothes 
and may not think about it in this way, but to this day we wear clothes to cover up the guilt and the shame we feel because inside we know we're sinners. We feel ashamed being uncovered. We look at somebody who doesn't cover up enough, right, according to social standards and mores which constantly move, but somebody who doesn't cover up enough, look at how she's dressed. Because something in us tells us you ought to be more ashamed than that. You ought to be more, that's what we mean by modest. You ought to be more aware of your sinfulness. You ought to cover up and not be so brazen. Okay. All right, verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and the wife hid themselves. Like a little kid, you know, you bake that chocolate cake and put the icing on it and say, don't touch that cake. That's for after dinner. Little kid can't stand it. You know, you go in the other room, goes in there, grabs some cake, takes off, eat the cake, chocolate all over the face. <gasps> what do I do? Hide the closet. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, among uh, of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? That's like when you know. You know where the little one is who has gotten into the cake. But you want to kind of put him in the vice a little bit. Where are you? Stand by the closet. Where are you? And inside the little one's going, and <laughs> they're in trouble, you know. Where are you? Ugh, I feel it, you know. And he said, he the man, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Uh-oh, here's an admission of guilt, right? I heard the sound of you in the garden. Well, if he hasn't done anything wrong, that should be great. Because the relationship is good. He hasn't done anything wrong. He's innocent, but he's not. So he says, and I was afraid, an admission of guilt. John writes in his first epistle that fear is the expectation of punishment. I was afraid, he says, dun, 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 what have you done? Right? I was afraid. Because I was naked, here's an admission of feeling guilt and shame. And I hid myself. In other words, I'm not coming to apologize and try to recover the relationship. I just want to hide. Oh, boy. Verse 11, he said, God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Same thing with the cake, right? Chocolate all over the face. You know they ate the cake, but you got to get it, you know. Did you eat that cake? Oh, oh. <laughs> Covered with chocolate, right? So probably, though, because he's an adult, he's going to fess up, Right? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Verse 12, the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I eat. And pass the buck. But she'll own up to it, right? Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And pass the buck. Okay, so here comes the damage. The Lord God said to the serpent, etc., etc. He curses the serpent, Dust you'll eat all the days of your life. You'll crawl on your belly. But look at verse 15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. We're going to come back to that. Verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. Notice he says multiply. Not I'll give you pain, I'll multiply. There already was going to be pain in childbearing. We think of pain in our American culture as automatically a bad or evil thing and try to mask it or get rid of it. Pain isn't bad. Pain's a natural way your body says, hey, there's something wrong. You know, people, there's a rare medical condition where people can not feel pain and it's terribly, terribly dangerous for them. They can be burning their hand on a stove and not know it. If they can break a bone and keep going and not know it and create more damage and more problems. Pain's not a bad thing. It tells you when something is wrong. It will be increased, however, because of what she has done. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. This is the desire for his authority as the head of the family. It's the beginning of the battle of the sexes. 